interested in finding out more, a sample of Ramona is available on the website that is KurzweilAI.net. If you want to go to that website and check it out for yourself, okay. Terre Haute, Indiana, good morning or good afternoon. Hi. Uh, first of all, Ray, I just want to say I'm a big fan of yours and I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Um, I was curious, I know that you, your ideas have been met with a lot of skepticism um, from those in the scientific community as well as various scholars. Um, I'm wondering if you're no noticing more of an upsurgence in uh, the acceptance of your ideas, such as particularly the law of accelerating returns, um, if it's being more accepted overall since, say, just when you published the um, spiritual machines in 99, just the past six or seven years, have you noticed more, um, more of an acceptance overall of uh, the ideas you're trying to get out there? Yes, definitely. Uh, and I think the acceleration of the pace of paradigm shift is, is becoming quite noticeable. Uh, we, st we now see dramatic changes in just a few years' time, and that wasn't so noticeable 10 years ago. And this exponential explosion of electronics and information technology is now apparent to the common person because we're all using these devices, uh, from digital cameras to iPods to social networks, to so, and people see how their capabilities change and today's limitations become get overcome in a short period of time. Uh, and also, uh, the various predictions are, I made in, in Age of Spiritual Machines, which was 1999, uh, have really tracked quite accurately in terms of the power of computation, the, the power of the internet, the power of communication technology, progress in making nanotechnology. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to share these ideas with uh, leadership scientific communities. Uh, I was recently uh, invited to give the keynote at the uh, off-site meeting of the directors of the National Institutes of Health and the chief scientists. And we, we were able to talk for actually a couple hours uh, about these kinds of ideas. And I would say they, they're very much on the same page because they're experiencing this exponential growth. Uh, for, for example, the first genome cost a billion dollars. They're not talking about collecting a million genomes at a thousand dollars each. It cost ten dollars for base fare in 1990. It's a penny today. So I mean, they're experiencing this exponential progression in price performance and capacity and every other aspect of information technology. And it's not just electronics. It's every aspect of information, whether it's brain data or the resolution of brain scanners. Or The Genome Project was controversial in 1990. It was not a mainstream project. Mainstream skeptics said this isn't going to work. We collected one ten thousandth of the genome in 1989. And uh, well, we doubled the amount of genetic data we've sequenced every year. That's continued past the end of the Genome Project. Uh, we're going to be able to collect everyone's genomes. So, I mean, things that were unheard of just a few years ago are now becoming commonplace. When you say the law of accelerating uh, returns, does that mean, in essence, that technology is getting smaller and cheaper and more efficient to operate? The law of accelerating returns deals with measurable attributes of information technology and basically says that the power of information technology, measured in many different ways, price performance, capacity, bandwidth, of, of information technology, not just in computers, but in all these different fields, it doubles every year. Now, depending on what you're measuring, the doubling time might be 12 months or 11 months or 13 months, but it's exponential. And people think in linear terms. They think that the current pace will, will just continue at the, at, at, at the rate that it's going now. And they don't take into consideration this exponential explosion. Exponential growth is, is seductive, but uh, when you start doubling big numbers, it, it becomes quite explosive. We have two hours with our guests uh, with your, more of your calls to talk with Ray Kurzweil. Uh, we're going to take a look at some of the technology that he employs in his lab. When he comes back, more of your calls and questions for him. So what is Kurzweil Technologies? Well, my field is pattern recognition, teaching computers to recognize patterns. And that's actually, in my opinion, the bulk of human intelligence. That's what humans do well. But computers are mastering that as well. 
So my first project was character recognition, teaching a computer to recognize any type style. That was actually the first time that was done. And then I did large vocabulary speech recognition. And we've applied pattern recognition to other types of patterns, e uh, EKG, heart signals, uh, financial data. We have a company that looks at that. Uh, and that's really, I think, the most important area of artificial intelligence. And ultimately, when we create a machine that will be at human levels, it will be because computers have mastered human levels of pattern recognition. But that's been my interest. So I've started uh, about 10 companies uh, commercializing and developing different aspects of uh, pattern recognition. Right behind you, we can see over your shoulder is, is a, uh, a screen that is doing artwork as you talk. What is that? Well, that was actually created by another computer scientist, Harold Cohen, who's worked for 30 years on actually mastering at least one style of human art. He has thousands of rules about how to create a painting. And this, this is a technology we've sponsored and uh, p you can download it at kurzweilcyberart.com for free. Every painting is different, and it's actually won awards in, in museums. Uh, but every few, every two minutes, it's painting a different picture. In the corner, you have an Edison voice writer. Yes, well, Edison's actually a good model for what we're trying to do, because he was continually coming up with creative ideas, thinking about what technology could do in the future and working on lots of different inventions, really to recreate uh, sound and visual, uh, visual world using the technology at that time. I mean, he created the first motion picture and first phonograph record. This is actually an early phonograph record where you could actually record and play both music. And it was also used for business correspondence. You could do dictation on it. And over here, there's a. So something that looks like a human being but is not a human being. Well, it's sort of symbolic of what we ultimately are trying to do, which is to recreate uh, human performance. So he's, uh, by looking somewhat realistic, is, is a symbol of that. And so we've worked on trying to recreate human speech recognition, uh, different aspects of human vision in our reading machines. We're actually going to be adding not just the ability to read print, but actually recognize objects to our reading machine. So a blind person can just hold the camera into, uh, point it at a room, and it'll actually tell him or her what's in the room, identify the objects and the people. So we're trying to recreate human skills. There's a medal down on a table here and a picture of you with President Clinton. Can you tell that story? Well, it's not much of a story. It's, uh, it's when I got the National Medal of Technology. From the from the president, but that was uh, that was a nice experience. This is actually a cartoon I commissioned in 1965, 40 years ago, and I had an interest in artificial intelligence at that time. And so this is a cartoon I designed. It was implemented by an artist friend of mine, and it pokes fun at, uh, or at least it comments on the nature of human experience. Uh, that brain is obviously having experiences in a virtual reality environment, because it doesn't look like it's having much fun. Uh, but we live inside our brains, and ultimately we'll, we'll actually be able to have our brain uh, feel like it's in some other environment, rather than the environment we're in. For example, the nanobot nanobots could shut down the signals coming from our real senses, replace them with the signals that we would be receiving if we were in a virtual environment. And then our brain will actually feel like it's not in the environment that it's really in, but it w would be in some virtual world. And it will be just as convincing as real reality. And we'll have a virtual body. You've got to move your our hand. It'll move your virtual hand. And it will feel very real. So that's actually, and uh, that will be feasible in 20 years or so. And that'll actually be a realization of this cartoon, which uh, I designed 40 years ago.
at Kurzweil on those stills was listed your junior high and high school teachers. Is anything that they taught you back when you were in school relevant to what you do today, something that you remember that, that still sticks with you? I think they were encouraging me to, to pursue my own ideas. I mean, I, that's why I put them down there. Uh, and they gave me the idea that I could, uh, they empowered me to just go off and spend most of my time doing my own projects, which I did in my spare time and while I was in school. I mean, under my textbook, which would be open, I'd be actually working on some, some project in junior high school and high school. Uh, my parents uh, were very encouraging. My, my father was a musician, my mother is an artist, uh, but they very much encouraged me to pursue my own ideas in computers. And I decided that I would be an inventor when I was five. And uh, How did you know that? Well, that's a good question. Maybe a few more years of analysis will <laughs> reveal that. Uh, um, I just had this fascination that you could put things together and create some kind of transcendence. I didn't have that word back then. Uh, but that you could create some kind of uh, powerful effect. I started building a rocket ship. And, but actually, I quickly got into virtual reality. When I was seven or eight, I created a mechanical virtual reality, a puppet theater. And I had this command station where I could control the world and move scenery in bring the moon down or bring a character on stage from, from this one command station. So that was kind of my first virtual reality project. But I had this conceit. I knew what I was going to be. Other kids were wondering, well, what should they be, a fireman or a nurse? Or, uh, and I said, well, I know what I'm going to be. And I never wavered in that uh, confidence. And your parents were, once they knew, were they OK with that? They were more than OK. They were very enthusiastic. and. Uh, there was this idea that science was important. It was just emerging uh, back then. But this was actually before Kennedy's charge to the nation with science. But, uh, and, you know, they were struggling artists, but they always provided me the resources to create my own inventions, which actually got to be somewhat expensive. And In one of the openings of the books, you said that you were influenced by Tom Swift books. Who's Tom Swift? Yeah, well, uh, I read all the Tom Swift Jr. books when I was 8, 9, and 10. I just uh, recently discovered there was actually Tom Swift Sr. books that were written around 1900. Uh, but the plots were always the same. Tom Swift would get into trouble. And usually the future of the human race hung in the balance also. And he would uh, retire to his lair, his basement, and come up with some invention, some idea that would save the day. And the, the moral was that no matter what kind of problem you face, there's an idea that can overcome it, and you can find that idea. And that was actually very much a, almost a religion in my household. Uh, I remember my grandfather coming back from Europe talking about how he had had the opportunity to handle some documents by Leonardo da Vinci with his own hands. And he talked about it with reverence, that really the power of human ideas to change the world was very much uh, a mantra in my family. And, th and that, that has impressed me. Uh, and that, that is my view, that if you encounter problems, any kind of problems, you can find the idea to overcome that problem. And, uh, and that's really our mission here uh, as part of the human civilization, to, to address the problems that, that we face and find the ideas to overcome them. And it's really, as I mentioned earlier, only technology that has the scale to overcome problems if we find the right set of ideas. We looked a little bit at your company during the break.